Hi there, I'm Sybil Chen and I'm the Senior Director of Program at Berkeley SCADIC, which is UC Berkeley's tech accelerator based here in the Bay Area in California. And I'm coming to you from my home office during this COVID period. So today I'm talking about surviving a global crisis as a startup. I think something, this topic seems particularly salient given the various challenges that uh, coronavirus has raised, all the hurdles that founders need to kind of circumvent now. So a little bit about SCADIC before I jump right in. Uh, SCADIC is one of the top five university accelerators in the US. Um, we have over 140 startups coming through our program every six months. So nearing almost 300 startups a year. And we have a physical accelerator based in downtown Berkeley. Um, and yeah, we have, you know, we're not only known as a university accelerator, but we also have are quite well known in the Bay Area. Um, in fact, we're the fourth largest by, you know, tr in terms of just sheer number of startups that we put through our program. And we actually have three different programs at SCADEC. We have an accelerator, um, which is about 20 to 25 startups, each cohort, and then an incubator track, which is about 100 to 120 startups. And finally, we have a third program, which is called the Global Innovation Partner Program, where we work with global startups and again, an aggregate that's somewhere between 140 and 150 startups every six months. Again, they're all coming, coming to us at varying stages. Um, most of them are early stage. So the accelerator track companies tend to be the most mature, have pretty decent product market fit, and typically you know, a few thousand customers and maybe grossing anywhere from you know, 10,000 to 150,000 in monthly recurring revenue. Generally, incubator companies are um, pretty early stage um, in terms of they might be pre-revenue, and if they do have revenue, it's somewhere between five and 10 month of recurring. Um, some of our global companies that come through us to us through the Global Innovation Partner Program um, tend to be fairly mature, and many of them are just trying to figure out if coming to the US uh, and set, setting up shop in the US makes a lot of sense. So my own background, I'm a former founder. I went to UC Berkeley myself for a college and uh, I've been at SCADEC originally as an advisor, but now have been the head of program. Um, really work closely with our startup founders and helping them navigate their journey. And um, we have tons of programming, almost 70 workshops during each cohort. We have a network of over 300 advisors and mentors and again, we work really closely and are very hands-on with the startup founders that we work with. So again, the insights and perspective I am sharing today is just through some of the engagements and interactions I've had in the past couple months. Um, by way of quick stats, you know, we've had, you know, a few hundred teams come through, startups come through our program. So in aggregate, they've raised almost 1.2 billion. 25 of those startups have gone on to raise series A or B. And we have just lots of resources uh, that we offer to our startups. Um, those of you that are kind of thinking of maybe coming to the US uh, during this period uh, of the COVID pandemic, I think that it might be um, well worth your time investigating incubators or accelerators that you can participate in. Most of them will offer a good chunk of um, resources and benefits that you can plug into as well as, most importantly, a network that can really help you hit the ground running. Um, our program culminates with what we call Demo Day, uh, which has about 700 to 750 investors attending. And that Demo Day is the best way for our accelerator startups to close a round of funding um, right at the end of the program. So traditionally, almost 62% of our accelerator track or cohort teams We'll close a, uh, a seed round at Demo Day uh, within the first three months of Demo Day. This most recent cohort has been a little bit different because they pitched right before the start of COVID-19. And we've certainly seen um, a drop in, in that percentage, um, and it, probably closer to 30 to 35% of startups having closed funding um, you know, around the time that COVID-19 was starting. So, Certainly, and I'll talk a little bit more about how the investor investing landscape and fundraising landscape has started to shift already. 
a little bit kind of of an overview of the impacts. And I don't want to belabor this point, these points because I think many of you already know uh, and have seen firsthand what it looks like in your country or your city. Um, you know, a lot of companies have been shifting the way that they're conducting business, um, everything from the way that they're engaging their employees. Of course, many of them have, um, most companies had to move to remote work um, on the onset and um, have had to kind of create flexible plans to, to accommodate these changes in the work environment and this remote work. In some cases, there's been a dec decrease in productivity, but I think as people get used to working from home, that may uh, change as well. Um, lots of sectors have been really hard hit. I think it goes without saying some of the most obvious ones are the restaurant and dining industry, travel and leisure, brick and mortar retail, and hospitality and gaming. I kind of point these out because later on I'll talk a little bit about how some of them have had to pivot um, as pivoting is one of the key strategies strategies in which startups are kind um, are in which startups are trying to cope um, with these times. So a little bit more about the impact on certain industries. Within the travel and leisure industry, we've seen, um, you know, at least within the U.S., almost 85 million dollars. Uh, I'm sorry, 85 billion dollars. I think that it should be. <laughs> um, uh, going to propping up airlines d during this COVID pandemic. 50% uh, um, is kind of the projected level that the global air traffic um, community, sorry, the level that the global air traffic will recover by year end. And they're all, you know, they're predicting almost three years before the industry kind of sees a sustainable revival. And this is based on Bloomberg News, um, a May 2nd article. Within the restaurants and dining industry, um, a good number of workers have been laid off over the past two months. Um, businesses have really kind of had to switch, the, switch up their, um, you know, kind of distribution methods. I think at least, you know, at least in the U.S., many of the restaurants have had to rely very heavily on delivery services and um, work with the likes of DoorDash and um, Instacart or just all sorts of delivery services that have helped them stay afloat. I wanted to talk a little bit about, so kind of switching gears a little bit that, you know, I wanted to kind of paint a picture of how things have been, you know, pretty dramatically impacted over the past several months. The response, at least within the tech community, um, has been interesting. And there was a Gartner report um, from March 30th. Uh, over 300 CFOs were surveyed. And it was interesting to see that almost 74% of them anticipate that a good, you know, their employees might permanently work from home um, after, even after the COVID-19 pandemic ends. So, and of that 74%, you can see here, you know, 25% um, believe that 10% of their employees will continue to work from home and 17% perceive that almost 20% of their employees will be working from home. So already we're seeing a massive shift in mindset from tech companies. Um, some of the large tech companies such as Google or Facebook or Twitter um, have made announcements about, you know, their workforce, you know, not starting back in the office um, until later this year in the case of tw Twitter, you know, they suggested that some chunk of their workforce might be permanently working remotely. So there's, again, a lot of shifting in, think, in thought around um, how to cope with this pandemic. And um, I think the long-term impact of this uh, COVID-19 is, is yet to be seen, but the first of which is really a shift uh, in, in, terms of the, in terms of remote working and how acceptable that is. So the impact of COVID-19, I would say, has been particularly um, magnified, you know, working at a startup, working with lots of early stage startups. And I would say this is true for a couple of reasons. Uh, one, many early stage startups haven't necessarily built their existing and entrenched customer base. Um, obviously, an early stage startup is typically just still trying to navigate and figure out the pro right product market fit. 
So being hit with a, a kind of an economic downturn from this global pandemic has kind of been tough as, as they you know, are try, still trying to do customer discovery. Um, number two is that they haven't necessarily raised a significant amount of capital. So that has direct implications on the type of runway they have to kind of really test the grounds and figure out you know, where to focus their time and energy. Um, and three, that their initial product market fit may no longer be relevant. And this is actually true for not just early stage startups, but more mature startups as well. Um, you know, I've seen several companies in the travel tech space um, and others that have really had to dramatically pivot uh, not just their product or product feature set, but sometimes their entire product and offering. And so what this means for a lot of early stage startups is that they really have to get far more creative than they've ever been before. Um, I wanted to also kind of jump into what the mindset of our early stage startup founders has been. We ran our own internal survey um, at the end of May with 123 respondents. And our general key findings that we were running a sentiment analysis to see how comfortable people were in terms of coming back to the office and working in person versus um, the, you know, work, the option of working remotely. Um, so based on this graph, you can see um, almost 46%, almost 47% of our founders prefer to work remotely. Um, and then 42% prefer to migrate to you know, a hybrid model where you know, they're half the time in the office and half the time working remotely from home. Uh, only 10% really wanted to get back to the office right away. And I think, you know, what we also saw is that the more mature a startup is, the more desperate or the more pressure they feel to get back to normalcy and to return to work, even in spite of potential health risks to um, working more closely in environments where it's potential, the potential to catch COVID is a little bit greater. So that kind of, I wanted to kind of set the backdrop just to kind of share a little bit about the mindset. But all of that being said, whether they're, you know, more, whether they're focused on working remotely or, um, you know, going back to work right away, it goes without saying that a lot of the founders are focused on a few key areas. The first of which is most of them have been forced to really consider ways to adjust their product market fit. To, to remain relevant and timely um, and to kind of shift their strategy based on changes in consumer behavior. Number two is they've really been forced to update their marketing and channel strategies to stay afloat. Three is custom, cutting costs and extending their runway. And four is kind of around fundraising and getting a deal done. And now I'm gonna briefly run through each of these areas and talk a little bit more about, about each of them in depth. On the, on the first front, product and market fit, um, we've seen a lot of our startups really kind of consider the value of their product and their audi audience. Um, you know, I can't count the number of startups that have slightly pivoted and or added to their offering so that their offering is more kind of relevant to COVID-19. Um, in other instances, we've seen a lot of companies kind of try to digitize their product and really kind of figure out digital, digital commerce strategy. And then of course, figuring out new techniques for connecting their audience to their product or service. One of our former startups and Skedek alumni company, KiwiBot, which has been known as a food delivery robot, um, actually quite well known on UC Berkeley's campus. Um, you'll usually see these little robots roaming around. Um, during this COVID period, they actually have pivoted uh, into delivering medical supplies to healthcare workers, as well as delivering snacks, to water and toiletries, uh, and face masks, face masks to people who don't, um, aren't, don't feel safe leaving home. So again, this is just one of many and countless cases. We recently did a blog piece featuring over 10 startups um, in our, in, in, you know, that are both alumni and current cohort that have, again, kind of featured, pivoted their future sets to really uh, be more relevant given this COVID pandemic. In terms of marketing and channel strategies, 
we're definitely seeing a lot of startups really focus on, you know, if they, if they, if they didn't already have solid and concrete branding and design, um, what they've realized is that because the digital online channel is so important, they have to have really um, clear branding online. You know, they've been leveraging various types of content marketing strategies, really focusing on lead gen and improving SEO and SEM. I think those are, those are marketing strategies that have really benefited a lot of our startups. In terms of the channel strategy, again, as I mentioned previously, investing in digital, many of our startups are beginning to invest in more digital commerce tools, um, really kind of planning and preparing for increased online traffic, and then really figuring out a more seamless integration between platforms um, and maximizing efficiency. I think as, a, as kind of a ca case in point, you know, when you, you just need to think about like the, the number of um, brick and mortar retail stores or restaurants that never even had digital um, commerce tools that are now doing business through DoorDash or Instacart. Um, and that seamless integration really makes a difference and really helps them kind of sell more and sell more quickly. Um, in terms of the distribution, again, digital commerce being a top priority for many now, um, you know, ways, the ways in which they can be more transparent about th their inventory and delivery, the more, um, you know, consumers, you know, are, the, the easier they make it for consumers to work with them, the more they sell. Um, and of course, offering flexibility, whether it's through delivery methods, consumer customer service, or different payment options. Um, I've seen plenty of startups integrate payment methods that um, more payment methods than are sometimes necessary, but definitely to kind of, you know, increase the number of consumers that they can potentially work with. This next section is probably the single most important um, for startup founders. I would say that cash is king right now and cutting costs and extending run runway is an absolute priority. By now, most of our startups have already had serious conversations with members of their team to really figure out how they will be extending their runway. But really this means that a lot of our founders have been cutting out non-essential costs. You know, a lot of the, I would say, free lunches or <laughs> perks and benefits that a lot of startups offer are, are now kind of at a minimum. Um, we've seen startups, st startup founders negotiate, renegotiate everything from office rent uh, to venture debt agreements. But I think this is really important. And, you know, a lot of founders may be sheepish or shy about negotiating with their landlord or landlady on office rent, but rent is one of the most obvious things to cut back on and one of the most expensive um, line items in, in a budget. So we, we actually encourage our startup um, founders to kind of have those conversations uh, when appropriate. And of course, it's never easy to scale down a team, but we've seen, seen a lot of founders kind of scale down, again, both on space, but also on the on headcount. And it's never an easy conversation to have when you're you know, building an early stage company, you often get um, really passionate early employees who probably weren't making that much anyway. So having those conversations can be really difficult. But um, you know, we encourage people to have those conversations early and to really kind of be transparent. Um, I think a second thing um, related to cut cost cutting and extending run runways, again, agility and operations. Um, being as the founder, being able to make speedy decisions um, that are well thought out is really important. Um, you know, we see we've seen a lot of our startup founders kind of reconfigure their short term goals, and you know, a lot of you know, as an example, a lot of companies may have had a product development roadmap um, taking them out the next two to three years. And in light of changing consumer behavior and the economic headwinds, so many of them have to had to really consider and rethink what they're focusing on over the next three months, six months, or a year. And, and then potentially investing in, in modifying their product offering to fit the market. 
as well as their market strategy. Um, and the last section in this on this slide is really just kind of, you know, helping your team adjust expectations. And I can't emphasize enough, I think, that being able to communicate with your team members proactively and really be transparent is of utmost importance. I've seen founders kind of hem and haw and try to figure out how to communicate uh, to their employees about not being able, you know, like having to um, kind of cut, cut certain members from the team. Um, I think that uh, conventional wisdom says that you want to just cut once and cut, you know, uh, and make a larger cut early on. Um, again, none of these decisions are easy to make. And so if, if you can be, if you can consider all the different options, um, you know, and make a decision, but communicate those decisions and be authentic in your communication, I think that's really key. Um, this next section is probably of the four, the most important, and the, not necessarily the most important, but the, the topic that is kind of weighing on most of most startup founders minds. And that is how will I fundraise and be, you know, successfully close a term sheet during this COVID period. Talking to various investors and VCs, I think a couple things remain true. They, they're very much, they, you know, the, the threshold, um, the bar you have to meet to, you know, to have a great team is even higher. So, you know, there's a great book that came out this past year, Secrets of Sand Hill, um, which Scott Cooper, who's the CEO of Andreessen wrote. And I think, you know, a lot of people talk about product market fit, but not enough people talk about founder market fit. And VCs and investors are very attuned to whether a founding team is the right team to be solving that particular problem. Um, so having a really, you know, badass founding team, but also a phenomenal team in general is really important. And I, when I mean phenomenal team, I mean the core team. Um, but now more than ever, having strong traction with proof points is also essential. Um, and a lot of investors are really carefully considering whether a business or startup will do well, is it, will do well even during a recession. Um, so that being said, <laughs> you know, the, the um, threshold to checking all the boxes is higher. But what can found, founders really do? Well, there are a couple of things. One is really continuing to leverage your existing network and continuing to build. You know, investors will, will always reference, check the, you know, founders that they're thinking about investing in. And so keeping your network warm, you know, maintaining relation, friendly relationships of, is always of utmost importance in a business when you're fundraising. Um, but, you know, the truth is so, much, so often your network and people you know, whether, you know, there are close relationships or peripheral relationships, they, they're so important in helping you in helping make warm intros and unlocking doors to other investors. So in terms of strategy around chasing the right investors, um, what I would say is to be really hyper-targeted about the investors you chase. Um, if you have conversations now with investors, many of them are slower to making decisions, but if they feel, if they're excited about your product um, and maybe they don't think you have enough traction yet, they will track you. Even if they're not ready to invest now, they will continue to track you. And having a strategy around keeping them warm, updating them with your traction, you know, at the right time when you've, you know, kind of, uh, kind of shown real progress over a period of time, it's, it's quite possible that keeping that warm relation will help to you know yield a positive outcome um when chasing investors i think it's also worth remembering that not all investors are very comfortable investing in this you know covid period or post covid period once things settle down so you really kind of have to feel them out early um time is precious you don't want to chase investors that are gonna hem and haw for a long time um, so really kind of prioritize who you're talking to. So what's likely to happen in the next couple months or years? 
it's anyone's guess. I mean, there are various indicators. And of course, I think uh, many notable economists have had somewhat bleak projections. Um, the New York Times had an April article um, titled Startups are Pummeled in the Great Unwinding. We've seen 20, about 22% uh, is the amount which, by which capital for, from seed stage funding has declined globally since January. A ZipRecruiter had a stat about 40% of staff cuts um, since the pandemic started. And sorry, the 40% is the amount of staff cuts at Zip Recruiter since the start of COVID. And 3,600 is the number of startup application, startup loan applications that Silicon Valley Bank has approved. So that's not insignificant. Um, and, you know, again, I think that what I've heard investors say over and over over the past several months is for startups right now, the strategy is to survive. And to make it to the other side. So, you know, if you, to the extent that you can quickly pivot and continue to have your product and offering be relevant, the extent to which you can cost cut and extend your runway, um, and again, keep, you know, warm relations with the investors that will help you stay afloat. Those are all of utmost importance. One thing that I felt was ne is necessary to kind of just touch upon lightly and briefly is that you know nobody in silicon a lot of people don't shy away from the topic of when it's time to close shop um you know it's a very hard decision and as a former founder you know you can looking back you can sometimes think oh you could see a, you know a long time coming but the truth is oftentimes you'll be working so hard to keep your startup afloat that sometimes it will hit you really hard when the, the decision, the hard decision to, to shut down finally has to be made. And it's a not, never an easy one to make. So, you know, you'll kind of see the signs um, because oftentimes it means that you'll have attempted a pivot or various pivots and that didn't suffice. You might have already tried to scale down, cut the team, cut office space, and that didn't help. You try to extend, you know, and milk every penny of your budget, but still ran out of, you know, runway and cash. And oftentimes founders on the team will start to throw in the towel and realize the um, financial, in, you know, kind of instability is too much to bear. At that point, you'll often see team members beginning to abandon ship. So, I only bring this up because we are again in kind of unprecedented times right now. And, you know, no one when I was a startup founder ever warned me what it would be like to, to potentially shut down. So I think it's important that when you consider how to shut down gracefully, it comes back to transparency on, you know, being authentic with your team, with your co-founders and remembering that everyone has really put in blood, sweat, and tears to help you get there. Um, a, a lot of times this, you know, put, winding down can be really emotional. And um, again, it's never easy, but to the extent that you can separate or wind down a startup gracefully, that's really important. And I think the thing to remember is that, you know, one of the greatest lessons or, you know, one of the greatest experiences you'll have in light, your life is being a founder because you'll have cut your teeth on so many different things, whether it was marketing, operations, business development, management, fundraising, um, it is very much character building. So you'll be able to take that with you wherever you go next. And um, so yeah, there is hope. And I think that, you know, we've seen a lot of companies pivot quickly. Um, we've seen in the past that, you know, various, um, you know, crises will kind of create um, a landscape where it's safe for companies to kind of um, think, think outside of the box and be more innovative. Um, and, you know, from, I think over 50% of the companies from the 2009 Fortune 500 list launched during a recession or bear market. And it is the case that oftentimes a crisis will 
be the catalyst and impetus for creative thinking and, you know, really kind of, you know, the test for entrepreneurs. Um, and it just forces people to get more creative and innovative. So with all of that being said, um, for those that have tuned in, I hope that some of the insights I've shared have been helpful. Um, I think again, everyone's kind of been navigating through this time in different ways. And I hope that all of you are able to make it to the other side during this uh, global crisis. Um, if ever we can be of help at Berkeley SCADEC, we would love to be helpful. Um, for anyone with questions or comments, please do feel free to email me. And my email is sybilchen at berkeley.edu. Um, hope, I hope you've enjoyed this talk and um, have a great day. Thanks. <laughs>